Hello and welcome to episode number 23 of Chell Squared. I'm your host, Andrew Chelney. And oh man, do we have a show for you today. By the way, happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Hope it's a great holiday weekend for everyone. I am home for the week. That's why I sound maybe slightly differently than I usually would. I've been recording in Newhouse for the past semester or so. Uh, but for now, for this week, I'm recording at home. Uh, before we get started, please make sure to follow the podcast on Twitter at Shell Squared and on Facebook at Shell Squared for more hot takes. News about future guests, poll questions, and a whole lot more. Please rate the show on iTunes if you enjoy listening. It means a lot to me. And every time you either like the show on SoundCloud or give it a rating on iTunes, a puppy gets a hug from its owner. I don't make the rules, just making sure you are in the know. By the way, Chell Squared is now on YouTube. Search Chell Squared Podcast and the show will be there if you prefer listening on there. As always... As, as is the usual in the NHL, a ton to get into this week. Recording this week's episode on Wednesday as opposed to Thursday because, again, tomorrow's Thanksgiving. And as much as I love talking hockey, as much as Brian loves talking hockey, my guest this week, we have bigger fish, or in this case, turkey, to fry. Big hockey news this week. The Blues fired head coach Mike Yo after being shut out by the Kings 2-0 earlier on and named Craig Berube interim coach. And the Oilers fired Todd McClellan and hired Ken Hitchcock, now his second time coming out of retirement to coach. So the, the uh, hockey solution of Brett Favre here, what's going on? By the way, the Oilers had a game the same day they fired McClellan and hired Hitchcock. And they beat the Sharks in overtime 4-3. to three. Leon Dreisaitl got the overtime goal. Hitchcock is happy. The team is happy. Oilers fans are happy. My fantasy team, most importantly, is happy. We're all happy campers here. By the way, have you seen the New York Rangers recently? Tank? What tank? What tank? They're going to win the cup, baby. That's what's going on. The Rangers are playing the Islanders right now up 4 nothing after two periods. The Rangers are 8-1-1 and in their last 10 games. Actually, the hottest team in the NHL. Detroit is second at 8-2. and We'll get into what went wrong in the lose for Hughes strategy and what's going right in the 2019 Stanley Cup champs strategy. It's Thanksgiving. Christmas is around the corner. Let me dream. Let me dream just a little bit. Okay, thank you. By the way, the Metropolitan Division is what what is what is going on in that division. Columbus is on top, and then the Rangers, somehow miraculously, then the Caps, then Sea Islanders, Hurricanes, then Flyers, then Devils, and the team that is currently tied for dead last in the division, 7-8 and 4 record, 18 points, the Pittsburgh Penguins. They blew a 4 to 1 lead to the out of nowhere, fiery Buffalo Sabres, who have now won six in a row. The distance between the first and last place in the Metro is eight points. Oh boy, there's a lot to unpack here. Again, it is Thanksgiving. It is early in the season. Um, no one's pushing the panic button just yet. No one is playing the parade just yet, except for maybe Rangers fans. But so far, the Penguins do not look good. And speaking of bad divisions, have you, seen, have you seen the Pacific Division? The Sharks leading with 26 points, then the Flames, then you got Vancouver, who I maintain does not have goaltending. They don't, they don't exist. It's, it's almost kind of like putting a couple of traffic cones in there, honestly. I, Mark Strom and Nielsen are not NHL goaltenders. Anyway, you got Edmonton, you got Anaheim, you got Arizona, you got Vegas, and LA, just like we all predicted in September. Distance between the first and seventh place is just seven points. The Kings trail the Sharks by 11 points. The Kings, by the way, have only scored 41 goals this season. They've played 20 games. That's a, about two goals a game. The that, that is the worst in the NHL. The next worst is Anaheim with 48 goals scored. The Pacific Division, by the way, features two teams with a record over 500. Two. San Jose and Calgary. Everyone else is either 500 or below. Yikes. Not good. By the way, the last day to sign an RFA before they are ineligible, ineligible to play for the season is December 1st, which is just about 10 days or so away. Today is Wednesday, November 21st, and, we'll, and William Nylander still does not have an NHL contract. We'll talk potential solutions for everyone involved. We'll get into all of that, the poll question, and a whole lot more. Joining me this week is the first person to be a return guest 
on Chell Squared. He hopped on board for the pilot ap- episode back in June, and he's back to talk more hockey. He's one half of the Garden Fateful podcast, the great Brian Wojtanek here with me tonight. Brian, how's it going? How's it going, Andrew, buddy? Thanks for having me on again. Absolutely. So, Brian, before we get into hockey here, Thanksgiving is tomorrow, but people have already been bumping Christmas music. I want your take on when it should be socially acceptable to listen to Christmas music. Because here's the thing. There's no quote-unquote November music, right? There's no, there's no music to get you in the mood for the turkey, right? I get that. But you can't be skipping holidays here. I've been seeing Christmas ads, Christmas everywhere so far for weeks. Thanksgiving is tomorrow, and I've been seeing it for weeks. I mean, Brian... What do you, this is, I feel like it's an atrocity to, to kind of skip over Thanksgiving and just go straight to Christmas, like two months early. What do you think? Of, what do you think about that? Oh, buddy, you're going to kick me off the show. I hate Thanksgiving. It's a, it's a trash wow. holiday. I, uh, the Chris blast that Christmas music, November 1st, like minute Halloween, you know, those memes where it's like, you know, me on October 31st, me on November 1st, for like the, like switching from Halloween to yeah, Christmas. Yeah. That's me. And I don't even like Halloween. Like I think Halloween's least a respectable holiday, but for many of the reasons that you just said, I don't like Thanksgiving. Giving. It's such a boring holiday. Like if, if you strip away the football, I don't like the food personally. I think Thanksgiving food is awful. I had a take today on Twitter that I think Super Bowl Sunday is a far better food holiday than Thanksgiving is. And like, and somebody else said it today too. It's like if Thanksgiving food was that good, we would go way out of our way to eat it more than once a year. But there's a reason why it's only done once a year and it's just not good. So for me, blast that Christmas music. There's a reason why the holiday has started to change into just a stepping stone for Christmas. Like if you go Black Friday shopping or Thanksgiving night shopping, like you'll see stores opening at like 3 p.m. on Thanksgiving because everybody knows all the only reason for that holiday outside of like spending time with family that you really don't want to spend time with is to go shopping for Christmas and get ready for that next big haul. So for me, I'm all aboard skipping holidays. There's only like two or three elite holidays in my opinion in general. And so Thanksgiving is not even close to one of them. So that's my Thanksgiving take. What are your elite holidays then? The, the, the elite world ho- needs there, to know. I, I think there's two. Okay. I mean, three, I guess I'll give, I'll throw Halloween a bone because Halloween has some ups and downs, I guess. I mean, it has, you have horror movies. You, there's a lot you can do with Halloween and at least has music to follow. Uh, it's Christmas. Number one. And then 4th of July, number two, 4th of July is an absolute elite holiday. Sorry to any Canadian listeners, but 4th of <laughs> July is an absolute elite holiday. In my opinion, you get hot dogs, nice weather, hang out by the pool, drink some beers, just hang out, watch some fireworks at night. Can't beat it. I mean, that's a fair take. It's very patriotic, very, uh, very spirited day of the year. That's for sure. I mean, H- Halloween, I feel like has to be up there because you have so much you got the music you got the festivities you got i mean you got all major you got all four major sports uh leagues or at least three baseball might be might have ended a little before then or around that time you have most of the major sports playing right now uh playing around thanksgiving uh around halloween excuse me uh the halloween there's a lot there's so and the candy I mean, listen, you might gain a pound, you might gain two or three or maybe a cavity or so, but it's worth it, right? At the end of the day, as long as you don't eat candy corn. I don't, what what do you think about candy corn, Brian? Because personally, I think it's a joke. It's, it's, Uh, it's colored sugar. It's all it is. It's sugar in triangle form that people put dye on and then eat. And then that's a Halloween candy. Why why is that a candy? It's sugar. It's colored candle wax. Like, but my thing is with, uh, with, with candy corn though, like here's how stupid my brain is, is like, I will bash candy corn until the end of time. If I go to a Halloween party and somebody puts a bowl of candy corn on the table, I'm just going to start shoveling in my mouth. I'm not going to like it. I'm not going to enjoy what I'm doing, but I'm going to feel festive because of it. And it's just one of those things where like, you can't stop eating, even though you know, you don't want to eat it and you know, it's not really good. Cause you're right. It is an absolute trash quote unquote candy or whatever you want to call it, but it is bad. Like candy corn, not on the list, but if you put it in front of me, my fat ass will eat it. So <laughs> it's garbage. It, uh, yeah. Cause he, cause here's the thing, right? Is, you know, caramel is sugar. Chocolate is mostly sugar. A, a lot of it any, is anyway, but at the same time, it's better. You know what I mean? You, cause, yep. cause candy corn is literally you, you take sugar, you put it in a triangle shape and then you color it orange or yellow or or, or whatever it is. And that's it. There's no extra layer to candy corn. It's literally just sugar. That's all it is. And I don't, and I just don't understand how 
it is like America's pastime for <laughs> Halloween candy because it because all it is is it's is it just the colors? I mean, you could color any candy you want and make it a Halloween candy if that's what if that's what qualifies it for Halloween candy. But I mean, candy corn is not what first of all not candy second of all not corn i mean this is this is a joke here they're over two it, it's just sugar i mean it's it's terrible <laughs> yeah you're not wrong it's not even like the flavors taste different either like the different colors it's not even like there's like oh the orange tastes a little bit different than the yellow and the white it's like no it's just it's just different levels of candle wax that you go down <laughs> that like it's just not good brian this is why i have you on the show <laughs> just uh, food takes right off the bat <laughs> get, get me in my comfort zone i like what you did there <laughs> absolutely so the st louis blues are now dead last in the central division they are seven nine and three the chicago blackhawks who are two five and three in their last 10 games right now and are currently losing to the washington capitals they are ahead of the blues in their division the chicago blackhawks are eight, eight and five the blues are seven nine and three Dead last in the Central, 17 points. They just got shut out by the Kings a couple of days ago, and now they fired Mike Yo, and now are promoting Craig Berube, who was an associate coach, to the interim head coach position. Coach Q doesn't have a job yet, or at least, I mean, maybe he doesn't want one, but to but to our knowledge, he's still on the job market. What is what is the plan for St. Louis right now? Because they can't seem to get it going either offensively one night or defensively another night. It's been a very up and down season for them. When the first line is hot of Schwartz, Tarasenko and O'Reilly, you cannot stop that line. But when they're not on, when they're not on fire during a game, it's like they're invisible or the rest of the team can't put together a good performance to bail them out. I mean, what do you have? What have you seen out of the blues that that suggest, okay, Greg, Craig Berube is now in charge. Things will improve. Yeah, it's tough. I know that's a team that on paper by all accounts should be a very good hockey team. That should be competing every night, especially in the central division this year. I mean, that division uh, outside of, it should be a tough division, but like, I mean, teams like Chicago, Chicago makes sense to me, right? Like that team should be going downhill every other year, like, or at least every year now, because I mean, you just have your cores getting older. They, they're still in cap hell and, you know, firing coach Q. It was just very evident that team was going downhill. So that makes sense to me. Dallas still has things to figure out. I mean, Jim Montgomery, this first year, a uh, team like Colorado who can, you know, put up seven goals a night or one, like that's a team on paper again, that should do more. But St. Louis is another team that should just be right up there in the top of that division. And they're, I mean, they're not in, uh, for me is obviously is like, I, I would love to blame Ryan O'Reilly and just the black cloud that he's brought on this last couple teams, but I'm not going to point the finger at him obviously. But yeah, I, I thought coach Q would have been an obvious choice for a St. Louis replacement. But, you know, I, it's obvious it's tough because he's so fresh off the market in Chicago with how much success he's had there and, you know, how much history he already has with that club. So, and uh, to be honest, I, I thought he would be the lock there. And then I saw the video of him in the parking lot of the Bears game on Monday night, just ripping shots with Chicago Bears fans. So it's <laughs> very right. clear he still has like uh, emotional attachment to that city. So for me, it's like he, I'm sure he got a call for the job, but like is he really going to want to go to a rival team like this fresh? Like he doesn't seem like a bitter guy. I think he gets it. I don't think he, I think he knows he's not the problem. It's uh Bowen, Bowen or Stan Bowen, whatever uh, the owner. And he's not fixing a lot of the problems that they had. And there's only so much you could do with the coach at that point. So I don't know. I, I think that the, where do the blues go? I have no idea. I mean, like, do, do you, do you take the season of the loss and sell the farm and start to rebuild again around that top line or, or like, what do you do? So I, that's a team that, is by become the trade deadline. If things don't get fixed, you can see some of these guys get chipped out. Like a, you know, some of those defensemen start to get moved for, you know, picks or players or prospects. So that'll be an interesting case for sure. I mean, he's been in St. Louis before that was his first coaching job was in, was head coach for the blues where he was there uh, from 96 to Oh four, where he got fired at 61 games in the season when the blues were 29, 23 and seven. I mean, here's the thing. I, I think St. Louis needs Coach Q more than Coach Q needs St. Louis. Because, 100%. because you, you've said it, the, the Bears video is incredible. Yeah. He, he, I, what was it, like a, uh, like a wood bar? Yeah, it looked like it was like a shot flight. Like, like there was like four people lined up and Coach Q <laughs> just in the middle yeah. just ripping shots with Bears fans in the parking lot of the Monday Night Football game. That was incredible. That that video that video when when Joel Quenville eventually gets into the Hall of Fame 
Yeah. I need that video to be played in the background <laughs> of his of his speech, of his of his montage. I need that video somewhere somewhere on stage during that night. I need it. Though I need it, you need it. The world needs that video <laughs> in that moment. <laughs> For sure. Couldn't agree more. Like that that's honestly what they should just put in the Hall of Fame. Don't even put any of his accolades. Just have a little tablet that just plays that video on a loop under at least, <laughs> at least a little case and that's it. Like that's how you honor Joel Quinville. Cuz that's how I remember him now. Like cuz coach Q like he he was a obviously a great coach. Like if he, if he never gets a coaching job again, it's by choice, obviously, because he's going to get called pretty much every time a position opens for the next few years, he's going to get the call. And if he doesn't get another job, it's by choice. So he, he, he made his legacy in Chicago and he, he'll go down. Like you said, he's a bona fide hall of fame coach and he's absolutely deserves to be in there. Uh, so, you know, my legacy of him was always like, obviously I hated that, that Chicago reign that, that, that dynasty was like so easy to root against because they won every year and you never want to see the same team win. And like, they have very, I think they have very hateable players. So, like coach Hugh always got looped into that for me, but then I just see that. And then like, you just realize, you know, he obviously probably fell in love with that city. Like you say, I obviously had time with St. Louis, but like the, the amount of uh, like wins and like the Stanley cups he had with Chicago probably brings a whole new meaning to that city for him. And there's just to see that video of him just ripping shots with bears fans. Like it's very clear. He still loves the city. He still loves the fans. He holds no hard feelings. It seems. And like, that, that's like, that's how I'll remember coach Q. So like, if he gets another coaching job, I, I kind of hope he doesn't at this point. Cause like, this is like a new, almost new look coach. Cue for me, and I, I kind of love it. <laughs> I mean, here's the thing: it, it really, honestly, kind of bothers me that Joel Quenville only has one Jack Adams trophy. Mm -hmm. It really bothers me because he's such a he. He's I, I'm pretty sure he's the second most winningest coach in history. I'm pretty sure the second or third or, or one of the top three or top four for sure. Eight hundred ninety wins. Eight hundred ninety. I mean, this is absolutely one of the best coaches of all time. I mean, as I mean, I don't, I don't have to say it. I mean, the stats say that, say it for, say it for me, say it for you, say it for everybody. The one thing that really kind of strikes me as strange here in the twelve thirteen season, the Chicago Blackhawks went thirty six seven and five. Joe Quenville did not win the Jack Adams that year, which, yeah. which that, that was the, that was the, uh, the lockout short year that the, the Jack Adams went to, went to Paul McLean. I mean, how, I don't understand when you lose less than 10 regular season games in 48 and you don't win the Jack Adams. I, I, I mean, what's going on that he won the Jack Adams in 2000, when the Blues went 51, 19, and 11, and then lost in the first round of the playoffs. Yeah. Which, I mean, you know, could be, could be better when you, when you do that well and you just kind of bounce. But, I mean, would Joel Quenville be a good fit, do you think, in St. Louis? Because I sure think he would. I don't know how Craig Berube is going to do because we've seen how he did in Philadelphia, and that yeah. didn't end well. How how is Craig Berube a better fit to to fix the Blues than Joel Quenville? No, uh, yeah, I think Coach Q would be great there. Obviously, he he has obviously plenty of experience working with high elite talent and St. Louis is a team that has that. I mean, you have O'Reilly, you have Tarasenko, you have a guy like Colton Pareko. You still have, I mean, they, I mean, they, they're not like hurting for elite talent by any means. So a guy who has, he has experience with players of that caliber. And I think the, you know, Mike, Yo lost that room very easily. So, I mean, it was easy for these guys to get complacent. It's, it's like, it, it's just like a miracle. What like a coaching change can do. And like, I mean, to use the Rangers as an example, I mean, if, if people don't chalk up what they're doing success to coaching, I mean, that they're nuts because on paper, this team should stink. So, but yeah, I think coach Q would be a good fit there. And again, I'm sure they called, like I said, I think if he doesn't take the job, it's by choice. 100%. Like, I don't think they, I think St. Louis knows it and they know it that as soon as that position came open in Chicago, that there was probably a little bit easier to pull the trigger on firing Mike. Yo, uh, and to, to the Jack Adams point, I agree. I think that awards garbage to begin with, uh, because it seems like one of those awards where they, like the NHL purposely goes out of their way to make sure there's very rarely a repeat winner. Cause if you look at like the history of the Jack Adams in like the right. last decade or so, like can you do you, I'll, I'll ask if you let you know offhand, but do you know the like the one current coach that has two Jack Adams under his belts from I think it was 2003 to now he has two different Jack Adams awards. Um, If I had to guess, it'd be probably John Tortorella, John Tortorella. 
Hey. One, with, one with Tampa and one with Vancouver, or Columbus last year. So, yeah. And Elaine Vignolt has a Jack Adams. So, I mean, it's not like it's a prestigious award, but it is. Obviously, I'm just well, joking. Right, right. Um, but, you know, it, it is. It's one of those awards where, like, you kind of roll your eyes at it because it seems like it's one of those things where the NHL is trying to, like, almost, like I said, give it to one different coach every every year. And it's, it's not a bad idea because with the, how much parity there is in the NHL, like, no team is going to play the same year after year. And, you know, the, just look at the leagues. Like, look exactly what you just said at the beginning of the show. Like just how bad the central division is, how bad the Pacific division is, how terrible the Metro is this year. Like there's so much parody from the league from year to year. It's just like you should be rewarding coaches. And if it happens to be the same coach, you shouldn't be afraid to pull the trigger on giving the Jack Adams award. So No, you're absolutely right. And by the way, one another coach that has just gotten a new job, as we mentioned, is Ken Hitchcock, who <laughs> just won his 824th career game as head coach now with the Edmonton Oilers. I mean – is there a problem with hiring new people in the NHL? Is yeah. there a problem with finding someone that could that could give a new angle, that could give a new perspective? I mean, because Ken Hitchcock is very much known for taking elite players and then making them into quote unquote two hundred feet, two hundred foot players. And and I I forgot what the exact quote today was, but he was talking about McDavid and how he wants to work on his all around game. Which here's the thing. If you are focusing on McDavid as a source for improvement, you're not looking in the right place. He is he McDavid, Dreisaitl, and Nugent Hopkins are the three players that are fine. Everybody else needs work, as we've seen from this team. So for 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 Ken Hitchcock to say, "Okay, I want McDavid to do this differently," you're you're not looking in the right area at all. You're not looking, you're not looking, you're not looking in the right country, not in the <laughs> right planet, not in not in the right galaxy. McDavid is the best player in the world. Why? Why are you looking to him to change the way he plays the game when he is the best player in the world? Don't don't worry about him because he will do whatever it takes to be the best player in the world because he already is the best player in the world. What is what is Ken Hitchcock's deal with trying to change the way that he that McDavid plays the game of hockey? McDavid, as I just said like 8 times, is the best player in the world. There's no reason why you should be trying to change the way he approaches the game of hockey. And Ken Hitchcock, I, I don't get why he's trying to do that. If you knew off the onset that this is what Hitchcock was going to do, why hire Ken Hitchcock? Why not hire someone else who could give a different look to the who to look uh, to the lineup? I mean, this is a joke. This is a joke. You can't. You can't step in as a head coach of this Oilers team and then look at McDavid and say, yeah, we, we, sh we should fix you instead of let's fix everybody besides you. Yeah, it's weird. Uh, I, this is one of my biggest problems with the NHL. It really is, is like some of these guys just feel like they have tenure in the league, not even with like a specific team, but just in the league in general. It's it, it's for like the McClellan to Hitchcock thing. It's pretty much like. It literally just says, you know, we have this nice rock, right? And the rock isn't doing the job it's supposed to do anymore. So we literally just got an older, bigger, kind of like weirder looking rock and we just replaced <laughs> it. And we're going to hope it fixes the problem. Like it's just, it's the NHL is not fixed away. Like it, a guy like Ken Hitchcock should not be getting a job right now. Like if there's one team that could benefit from an outside point of view, like you said, it's the Edmonton Oilers. Like this yeah. team hasn't been able to figure it out since that one playoff run and they have the best player on the planet on their team. It should not be hard to build around this kid. Just get him people who can play and they, you know, they, you can chalk it up to like bad, bad GM and we can crap on Peter Trelli all we want, which is absolutely what you should do with this team. Like it's completely justified because the fact that he, this guy cannot look at the best player on the planet earth of pl hockey and build a team around him is absolutely insane to me. It should not be hard and he just can't do it. Uh, but I, I, I don't know. I don't know know why the NHL does this. I don't know why they just go through this recycled coach phase. You know, I mean, you can look at the NFL. The NFL does the same thing too. Like some of these guys just feel like they're tenured into the league. I think like major league baseball does a pretty good job of mixing it up and getting new managers in and at least hiring coaches from different positions and stuff like that. And so 
I, I don't know. Like the, the NHL is frustrating in that aspect. And I, I don't feel bad for the Oilers. I, I genuinely don't. I feel bad for Connor McDavid and I don't feel bad for anything else outside of that because Peter Charlie has single handedly just run this franchise in the ground. And you know, it's very clear. His draft picks doesn't work. I mean, just look at Taylor Hall's on the devils now just killing it. You have uh yes, Jesse Pugliarvi who should be good on the roster right now playing. He's down in the AHL. Uh, uh, who's the other one? Uh, Yakupov, like God, yeah. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. So like, I mean, Eberle they've had some the bad draft too. luck that too. Yeah. Eberle, like to, to let some of these guys go. And I, I get Yakupov's probably a justified case. And yes, he probably hasn't been great, but like, you know, this team's not making the playoffs right now anyway. So, you know, let him play, let him work it out. I don't know. It, it, to me again, I don't think Hitchcock's the answer. And like that first quote, like you said, where he's talking about trying to like get McDavid's game where he said, like, even the, even the, the quote he said that drove me nuts where he's like, you know, I can get the team to a level. They haven't been to, like been to yet. It's like, dude, you couldn't do that in St. Louis. Like, what right. do you mean? Like you're going to do it in Edmonton now when you're older and the game just keeps outgrowing some of these guys. Like, and that's why I'm so gl- grateful for like teams like Dallas and the Rangers to reach out to like these NCAA coaches and give them a chance. And, you know, by all accounts, both teams have been working out pretty well so far. And it seems like both these guys are doing a good job of bringing something new to the NHL. And just, you know, it's, it's just a new voice and a new, you know, a new style. And I, I wish more, more teams would do it, but unfortunately just because again, it's the easy, it, it seems like the easy fix at the time for some of these teams to bring in a coach that has experience. And it, it's just frustrating. I wish more teams would go outside the box, but you know, that's the NHL for you. The one group that I really feel bad for are the fans because they got a taste of playoff hockey and good playoff hockey. They almost made it to the Western Conference final a couple of years ago, and then they just didn't make it again. It's one of those things where they made it. They were so close to being one of the final four, and then they didn't make it, and now they're back to square one where they really shouldn't be. They're they're they have a very similar roster to the roster that they had uh, in that run. Not quite the same, obviously. And also you have players like Lucic who are older. And even though he's only 30 years old, he doesn't really have his legs anymore. He's not scoring anymore. I think he has like one even strength goal in his last 60 some odd, or maybe this, it could be 70 some odd, or I mean, 9,000 games or so (laughs) in the last 9,000 games, games or so. But I mean, the, the Oilers are a team that is, it's a, it's a joke, and it really does does fall on the GM uh, Pichirelli. And it, I think I think for him this was kind of a uh, I'll, uh, I'm gonna play my last card and see what happens thing because I've I've read from a couple of people uh, that this could be the the end of the road for McClellan, which by the way should have been years ago. But it, it could be the end of the road for McClellan, um, not for McClellan, for Chiarelli, excuse me, for Chiarelli, if they don't make the playoffs. Which, I mean, the, here's the thing. If you trade Taylor Hall, who's now a league MVP, if you trade uh, Eberly for third-line center, who is no longer on your team, and you, and you now you're wondering where your scoring is, well, I mean, yeah, that's 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 where it went. And it when you have a when you have a general manager like that, it's tough to feel bad for the team. But I I truly feel bad for that team. I truly feel bad for that city, that fan base, because they tasted it. They tasted success, and now they're back to where they were before. And it's it's really sad. Yep, I could agree more. The another division that we that we talked about a little bit earlier is the Metropolitan Division. Now the Columbus Blue Jackets are ahead; uh, they're leading the the division with twenty six points. The Pittsburgh Penguins, I don't know what is going on in Pittsburgh. They are seven eight and four, tied currently with the New Jersey Devils. Both teams are winning in their respective games right now. The Devils are five to two on the Montreal Canadiens. And the Pittsburgh Penguins are up five to one against the Dallas Stars. Both games are in the third period, unless you know, barring a complete collapse by both teams. It looks like the Devils and the Pittsburgh Penguins will both win, but they will still be seventh and eighth, respectively, in the division because Philadelphia also has twenty points, um, and New Jersey and. Pittsburgh will now also have 20 points, so they'll both still be in the bottom of the of the division. But good news is they won't be dead last in the East anymore because now it's going to be Florida's turn. Florida with uh, 19 points, 8, 7, and 3. They are currently losing to the Tampa Bay Lightning 4-1. to one. I mean, I don't understand Florida. For I'm, I'm gonna t- We're going to talk about the Metropolitan Division, but 
I don't understand the Florida Panthers. Mike Hoffman is on a 17-game point-scoring streak. 17 games. He's broken Pavel Bure's record in Florida. He he now has Florida's all-time record for most consecutive games at the point. How is this team... Eight seven and three in those games. I it, their record is eight seven and three. How is that even possible? He how is that possible when you have a when you have a guy who is lighting it up who just keeps on finding the back of the net either scoring it or helping someone score it and yet you are five hundred. I guess like I guess McDavid's the same way in Edmonton. The Oilers are ten ten and one. But I mean, how is that? How do you let that happen if you are a head coach, if you're a general manager? I mean, Florida has had a rut of of injury problems, and as and we've saw we've seen Vinny Trocheck a couple of days ago with a terrible leg injury. He's out for a long time. I mean, Florida, Florida's just it. It really is sad to see. And also, totally aside, Mike Hoffman, as I just mentioned, points in seventeen straight games. Okay, I have him on my fantasy team, luckily, drafted him, uh, didn't even, you know, l- luckily drafted him before anyone else could. This man is owned not in 100% of leagues in ESPN Fantasy League, not in 90%, not in 80%, 77.4% of NHL, uh, of NHL Fantasy uh, League teams in the, on ESPN own Mike Hoffman. That's down 2.1%, according... I'm looking at fantasy.espn.com right now. How is that even possible? I don't, under, I don't understand that. This man... I, I mean, maybe I've started, I don't, I don't know. But this man has scored in 17 straight games. How is he not on people's fantasy teams? This man has 19 points in 18 games. I mean... Andrei Svechnikov, who has eight points in 20 games, I have him on my team too, is owned in 82.8% of leagues. How is that possible? This is completely aside as a just a rant because I don't, I don't get fantasy hockey sometimes because how do you have a guy who has scored in so many straight games and then you... Andrei Svechnikov, who was supposed to be a little bit better offensively to this point, um, I'm not dropping him just yet because I still have faith in Andrei Svechnikov to, to turn it up at some point soon. I also have Will, William Nylander, who, by the way, who we'll get to uh, a little bit later on here, but by the way, can we please get him a contract? My fantasy team is dying and needs support. Anyway, uh, maybe maybe not dying. They we uh, My fantasy team has won, I think, four in a row now. I think we're, we're in good shape. I need William Nylander to, to get a contract here. But the Florida Panthers are, I don't know what's going on in Florida, the the Metropolitan, like what, <sighs> Brian, what is, what is going on in hockey? What is going on? Yeah, this is why I love, this is why I love the NHL. I just talked about why I hate the NHL for coaches. This is why I love the NHL. It's so weird from year to year. Like, again, talk about a team that should be good on paper. It's Florida. Like I, I love Florida. I thought, you know, we, we, every year and before the NHL starts, all the guys at Gotham sports network, like we have a gambling channel and we put up our, our like our NHL futures and like who we're going to put bets on our point totals and all that stuff. And I feel bad for poor Fitzy. Cause he was trying to convince the whole crew to put a uh, future on the Florida to win the Atlantic. That's not looking so good for him. So sorry, Fitz, for losing some money there. But Yikes. yeah, the NHL is weird. And like one of the teams that I try to convince everybody, and I, I tried, and nobody listened to old old Woji here. Nobody, nobody, nobody want to take the fat boy's advice. But I told everybody <laughs> that Pittsburgh point total is going to be down this year. I knew it. I knew it going into the season. I just I had a gut feeling that one of these teams in the Metro that's been so dominant over the past few years it was going to fall down apart. And to be fair, like I still thought Pittsburgh was going to make the playoffs, but their, their, their point total, they were asking for like 99 points and they're just no way they're getting there. And you know, it, you chalk it up to like, they barely made any moves. You could tell me that bringing in Jack Johnson was good for the defense all you want, no, but I'm not going to buy no, it for a split I will, second. Yeah. This, n- none of those takes will be on this show. Jack Johnson no. is a terrible defenseman who got paid yeah. a way. Why would you pay Jack Johnson like more than veteran, not, not veterans minimum, the, the league minimum? Why would you give Jack Johnson a peer, a contract at all? He's not good. And no. you give him a three, you give him a, a ridiculous contract to play defense, which he can't do. It's a terrible, terrible contract. I mean, the, you will not hear a take that Jack Johnson plays 
good defense on this on on this podcast. This will not be an occurrence at yeah. all. And they try to chalk that up as their, their big free agent signing. And to be honest, like that, uh, that's not how that works. Like no. you have to do more than that. And it's clear that the team knows they're desperate now too, man. Like you can see it in their eyes. Like what, I mean that look at the, look at the Tanner Pearson trade for Carl Hagelin. Like there's no other reason to do that move other than like, we need to start changing something. And that's, that's what we're going to try to do. But yeah, I, I tried to tell the boys that, you know, Pittsburgh, uh, was, was not going to be it this year. And to be fair, there's still a lot of hockey left. And if you look at the Metro now, like everybody's still within reach of each other. Like, I mean, from eight, look at from just where the Rangers are at second place, they will be at 26 points after this game. And they'll only be eight parts away from eight points away from the, uh, the uh, Penguins after tonight. So like, it's not impossible. It's, you know, it's uh, four games changes anything, but uh, a terrible start to start the season. Yeah. You, you, you know, you hate to see it to such a, to such a good franchise with such good fans. If you can't sense the sarcasm in my voice and I'm sorry for you, but uh, <laughs> I, I don't feel bad for the Penguins, but the rest of the Metro, you know, I, there's, there's some surprises I expected. Obviously, I, I didn't expect the Isles to be as competitive as they were just because of the weird offseason moves they made. I did expect the Devils and the Flyers to be a team that would be making a little bit more noise up at the top. And obviously nobody really expected the Rangers to be where they are. So, you know, the, the Metro itself is just a really weird division right now. And I, I, I'm, I'm here for it because the Rangers are right in the thick of the mix. And, you know, you love to see that. So speaking of the Rangers, they're now going to be 12, eight and two. They are 8-1-1 one one in their last 10 games. Of course, the only regulation loss was against the Islanders last week. Somehow, miraculously, they are tied for first in the Metro Division with 26 points. I don't know how that... I don't know what is going on with the Rangers. I mean, this this is a team that was supposed to tank, lose for Hughes, and now they are somehow clawing their way to a playoff spot. I mean, obviously, again, it's Thanksgiving. There's about 70 games left to play. Not 70 games. There is about 60 games left to play. There's a lot of hockey left. But if you if you look at years prior, the teams that are in a playoff spot around the Christmas break, uh, not Christmas break, around Thanksgiving break are usually the teams that make the playoffs. So it, it really interests me to see the Rangers in a playoff spot and Pittsburgh in dead last. I mean, that is, that is, if you would have told me the day before the season opener that the Rangers come Thanksgiving, we're going to be in second place in the Metro and the Pittsburgh Penguins are going to be dead last. I mean, I, not only would I have looked at you differently, we would have, I, I would have laughed in your face, honestly. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is a team that, this t the Rangers team should have been tanking, should have been bad, and they should still be bad. I mean, obviously, I think they're going to regress. They're, they're not going to make the playoffs. And even if they do make the playoffs, what are they going to do? Who are they going to beat? Who realistically are they going to beat? They might be, I mean, they might be Buffalo, maybe, but Buffalo has been really good, really good. And you take a look around in the Eastern Conference. I mean, there's not a whole lot of teams that I would want the Rangers to play in the first round, not even the second or the third round. This is a Rangers team that is good for now, but I, I don't see them performing well in the playoffs if they do make it, which I don't think they will. But this goes into my uh, poll question for this week. So my poll question was, who do you think will win the Calder trophy this season now i tweeted this out without philip Heedle as one of the four options and you retweeted the poll and i've gotten about <laughs> sarcat i mean i'm gonna i'm gonna you know i around a hundred thousand responses from rangers fans saying philip Heedle, listen this is a 19 year old kid goals in five straight games the only and the only teenager in Rangers history to do that. Now the twenty second teenager in NHL history to do that. Five goals now, five straight games. Here's the thing: when you have here are my four options. By the way, my four options. I got uh, almost two hundred and seventy votes on this poll. And of course, if uh, if you want to vote on the poll, if you want to tweet uh, at the poll, it's uh, on Twitter at Shell Squared. Now, the four choices I'm going to read them to you, and I'm not going to tell you which uh, which 
choices got how many how many percentage votes and i'm gonna i'm gonna ask you what what you would have picked before uh before i do that but the four choices were ross mistaline elias uh Pedersen, who my computer wrote eliason it's elias my computer needs to get it together i should i should have double checked triple checked but eliason for some it's elias Pedersen. then you got your sperry kokaniemi and miro heiskanen which of the four would you think is going to win the Calder? Well, it's got to be Elias Pettersson, right? Like uh, just the start he had to the season and the way he's playing right now, he's got nine. I think he's got 19 and 17. Like he's got 19.17 games and he missed. I mean, that's it, the, the, the thing that I should think he should be rewarded for more is coming back from the injury he had in the beginning of the season. Cause I mean, he's a young kid. He's a small kid. He, you know, he's, he got, he got crushed and I don't think it was necessarily a dirty hit, but you know, it was very clear. It shook him up and he still came back from that and just looked as good as he has. And, you know, to be fair, he's playing on a Vancouver team that, you know, I, I just don't think is that impressive yet. So for him to just kind of do what he's doing there, it's, it's awesome. And yeah, I agree with you. Like I love Filipino to death. He's got five and five games and that's awesome to see. And I'm so happy that he got that camel off his back, but it, there's still a lot of hockey to be played on that aspect. And, you know, I, I do agree with you. I think the Rangers are a team that will regress. And I just think it's, you know, the, the course of nature, you know, I, I know all the underlying numbers and stuff like that are saying that like, they're actually playing, you know, competitive hockey. And this isn't just like the Islanders who have like a high PDO and that, you know, that this team, it just, it, what they're doing isn't sustainable. And some of those Rangers play might be. So yeah, I, I think it's just a natural course of the Rangers might fall apart here. And, you know, he'll probably, you know, obviously won't be scoring for the next 60 something game straight. So, you know, for me, it's Elias or Patterson. I, I mean, five and yeah. five. Who knows? I mean, if the guy goes on a sixty-game goal streak, I'll tattoo his entire face onto my body at some point. <laughs> like, it, that would just be the most unbelievable thing anybody's ever seen in all of sports as a nineteen-year-old kid. But that's the beautiful part of it. Is like, even if he, you know, even if even if Filipino isn't in the Calder conversation at the end of the season. Does it really matter if he has an amazing season? No, because like I just said with the Jack Adams Award. Some of these awards could not matter less. And the Calder's awesome. Don't get me wrong. Like, I was a little envious of the Islanders having a Calder winner because it's just nice to know that your future's in good hands. And, like, that's obviously what that's a sign of. And, no, Hedl not winning the Calder is not a sign of that by any stretch of the imagination. So, uh, for me, it should be Patterson. I don't think – unless, again, if anything changes where he misses more time doing an injury. But I you know, I think he'll run away with it, no doubt. I, w- I was watching Elias Patterson. I was watching the Canucks game the other day, and his shot. I've never seen a shot that resembles Alex Ovechkin's shot the way Pedersen's shot does. His shot is so clean, is so quick, is so precise. I've never seen that other than Alex Ovechkin. I mean, this is this is going to be this is going to be the next Ovechkin. As soon as Ovechkin's done, Pedersen is going to keep that momentum going i mean that his shot is i might be exaggerating a little bit here but i also truly feel this way pedersen has one of if not the second best shot in the league and this kid is a this kid's what this kid's a teenager i mean this kid is you know, he's, he's, he, he's still growing. He's still going to get bigger. This is one of the best up and coming players that the league has ever seen. And the, the, by the way, the four, uh, answers were Rasmus Dahlin got 17% of the vote. Koka Niemi got 4%. Miro Heiskanen got 1% and 78% of the vote went to Elias Pettersson. The, the poll is now over 270 votes. I mean, the the people have spoken, and here's the thing. I would love for Filipino for Filipino to win the Calder. I got a lot of responses. I got one from Aunt Connor J. Chris C R I S. That's that, sh- and and he said Brett Howden should win the Calder. I mean, listen, he, he, listen. Brett Howden's a great kid. Don't get me wrong. He's gonna be a, he's gonna be a solid player. How do you give the Calder to Brett Howden? Instead of Elias Patterson, how do you how, how do you do that? <laughs> is, yeah, you just, is my you just question. you just don't and like I like I love Brett Howden. I'm very happy he's on the team and you know that I I really 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 pray we get to a point at some point in the Rangers you know the next few years where we look back on that trade and we start calling it the Brett Howden trade because yeah. that 
this could look bad for Tampa and you know, I, I want it to, you know, you always want a trade that where people are talking about, Oh, you guys got fleeced for McDonough and Miller and all that stuff. You know, you obviously would love to have look back in that trade and be like, that's the Brett Howden trade. But again, you know, you just absolutely and realistic. If you're, if you're, if you're just a fan of the NHL in general, you cannot put his name in the conversation right no. now. He's a good player. He had a good start to the season. You know, he hasn't scored, you know, he's putting still, still putting some assists on the board. He hasn't scored in a little bit, but you know, it, he, he's a fine hockey player. And again, it's another thing for Rangers fan. I can't stress this enough. It's like there should be nobody getting upset at the end of the season. If neither of these guys are in the conversation for the Calder and it's, that's fine. Cause again, we, there's bigger fish to fry. And so that's, I guess that's my take on that for the Rangers aspect. Yeah. I mean, you're preaching right now, Anthony Gasparino at your at NY Rangers 3017. Uh, he, he responded to the poll with you shouldn't have tagged Woj in this. You know what this <laughs> means. And then there's a meme uh, with brace yourself. Philip Hedl for the Calder posts are coming. I mean, he, here's the thing. I, I love Philip Hedl. You love Philip Hedl. We all love Philip Hedl. And this kid's like 19 years old or 18, 19 years old and five goal, you know, goals in five straight games. This kid's going to be a stud. Yeah. Elias and Patterson and should that's win the, the call. It's, it's easy to say you love Hedo right now, but I got I got the receipt on some of you Rangers fans who were ready to write this kid off when he wasn't scoring in the first 12, 15 games. <laughs> that's so true. don't 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 think that you're going to get away scot free because I got some receipts on some of you Rangers fans. So I got them in my back pocket. So don't you guys worry. But again, it's easy to love Hedo now because of what he's doing. And again, he's uh, this is exactly what you want to see from him. But he should absolutely just not be in the name for the, conver- the call their conversation. It, you know, let's talk again in two months and I'll let you know if he should be in there. But right. as of right now, if you're talking about start to the season, in first 20 or so games, it's Elias Patterson and it shouldn't be close right now. So No, you're, you're totally right. And speaking of receipts, by the way, com- kind of going off base a little bit here, Oscar Lindbergh. I, yeah. I, I'm keeping so many receipts on Oscar Lindbergh because I remember very clearly, and I'm sure you do as well, a couple of years ago, when there's a decision to keep Lindbergh or step on or both, I mean, you know, during the expansion draft and what was going to happen there, Rangers fans were, some, some of them, not all of them, obviously, but there were some Rangers fans out there who claimed that Oscar Lindbergh was going to be a better player than Derek Stepan. How has that turned out so far? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Look, you could probably find some receipts on me on Lindbergh, but it's certainly not to that extent. Like I liked Oscar Lindbergh a lot. And I thought, you know, down the road, you know, obviously him playing center at the time, the Rangers were super thin at that position. And it seemed like that was a perfect position for him to stay in. And I, you know, it's very clear that the Rangers got away with one with keeping Jesper Foss. And at the time, I guess Michael Grabner was another name that could have been thrown in the conversation for Vegas. And, you know, Grabner goes and gets us a second round pick in Igor Rykov. And, you know, Jesper Foss is like a, a Swiss army knife. The guy's a utility player you could put him anywhere and you know put out a good performance so yeah the rangers definitely got the better end of that deal and certainly certainly nowhere close to even Derek, Derek step i'd be surprised if the guys in the nhl at the end of the year i'll be i'll be honest with you is i like oscar Lindbergh, but i can easily see him going to the euro leagues whether it be the khl or just going back to sweden and playing so no that's fair i mean last season he didn't play every game he was healthy scratch for some of them he put up a whopping 11 points in 63 games with the Golden Knights last year. And this and this year in 8 games he has nothing to sh- nothing on the on the score sheet to 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 back that up. No points, no goals, no nothing. And I, Derek Sepon, meanwhile, has I, you know, f- f- safe to say more than zero points this season. That's for sure. Uh, d- what about William Nylander, who also, by the way, has zero points this season? Granted, he hasn't played; doesn't have a, doesn't have a contract. I mean, what would be a great deal for Nylander if you are a team looking to trade for him? I mean, I've argued Justin Falk for. William Nylander, Carolina would love Nylander. I think they yeah. have a they have a stockpile of defensemen. Nylander would improve their offense by that much, and they need that right now. I mean, there's a couple of other teams. I mean, obviously we can we can both of us are Rangers fans. We can sit here and deliberate. You know, oh, you know, what would be a great deal to get Nylander to come to New York or whatever. But at the end of the day, you know, I don't think Gordon will will take that deal unless it truly benefits the Rangers, which I don't know 
will happen in that situation. Again, the deadline to sign him is December 1st. Today's November 21st. So the deadline is approaching quickly. We will have a resolution for William Nylander sooner rather than later for the Leafs, for for Dubis, for Nylander, for my fantasy team that has been sitting Nylander for the past two months. Can we get it together? Can we get him a contract? My fantasy team is dying. We need him. But what is the what what is what's the ultimatum here for Nylander? Is it going to be a Leaf? Is it going to be? I mean, where is he going? What what would what would be a great ideal package to acquire William Nylander? And who would be the best fit for him? Yeah, this is, I think this is one of my favorite things happening in the NHL this year. It, and the NHL just needs stories like this. Like they need players that are willing to hold out and get their bag. And I, I'll, I'm on Team William Nylander until the end of time. I am such a diehard. Go get your bag. Like you're a professional athlete. Go get the bag. And just look. And, and I could not be more relevant of what happened to Alex Smith the other day. The dude right. almost snapped. I mean, the dude snapped his leg in two different places. Broke his tibia and his fibula. And you know who knows if we we'll play again. I mean, obviously more medicines much better now, but you never know if you're going to come back the same players that that's why you get your guaranteed money. If you're worth it, go get it. And that's, I love it. So in my opinion, I really hope the Nylander camp doesn't fold in terms of a uh, signing. You know, I hope he doesn't take less just because of where they're at and because the deadline's coming up. Like you said, I hope he doesn't fold and, you know, just sign just to sign. I hope he holds out and gets to the team. He would be. And I, I think you're right. I think the obvious pick would be Carolina. Now on my end, I don't think Justin Falk would be the piece. I think you're looking at a Brett Pesci or a Jacob Slavin. And I think those are obviously much harder for Carolina to part with. So I'm not sure if Justin Falk would get it done, but you know, it, it, every day that goes by, it gets harder for Toronto to put together a deal and, you know, have team take them seriously because the NA, everybody knows that Toronto's on, you know, doesn't have the ball in their court anymore. So it, it's tough, man. It's, it's such a weird situation, but I'm, I'm so fascinated by it. I think where I stand right now is like, I, I, I think the teams that will trade for him, they, I mean, they, they, they have to know he's going to sign there, and like they're going to be able to sign him for the money that he obviously wants. So it, it's tough, but I think Carolina would be the, I think the landing spot. I think they desperately, like you said, they desperately need it. And I think they do have the pieces to part with that could get him there. But again, it's just a matter of does Carolina want to let go, knowing that they're going to have to lock this guy down long term. Or not, and like you mentioned, the Rangers. But yeah, I, I, I'm 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 in a weird boat with them. I think the only way you know if you're in the next ten days, if you're gonna make a move for William Nylander, and and who knows what the front office is thinking right now. Like, and not to go on a Rangers rant, but like, no, who sure. knows what that what they're thinking? Because you know, what do you do now? Like, I mean realistically, if you come close to the trade deadline and this team's flirting with being, you know, the third team in the Metro or like a number one or two in the wild card, just because it could happen. Who knows? It, the, do you still commit to the plan that you put out the letter last year of like, do we sell or do we rebuild? So I think the only way you can obviously make a plan uh, to be like, we got to acquire William Nylander is if you think this team's going to be competitive this year and then the following year, because then, you know, then you look at, can we, can we potentially in one calendar year, put down William Nylander and Artemi Panarin on this roster while still having Leah Sanderson, while still having Filipino, while still having Vitaly Krostov come over, while still having Rykov and Shostorkin. Like they have, they're going to have kids in the next few years on these smaller contracts. So they can try to make it work if the cap does go up every year. And then there's a compliance buyout if they need, you know, and then, you know, not to like, put a damper on it, but you know, there's only a couple more years with left with Hank on the book. And then, you know, guys like Mark stalls and these big contracts are going to start going out the wayside. So the Rangers will have the space to play with over time. It's just a matter of how committed are you to a rebuild versus like, do we think we could win now? And I think, you know, if you think you can win now, then absolutely go out and trade the pieces for William Nylander, go give up a Brady Shea. Cause you have plenty of defensive prospects in the pipeline now that, you know, could have come over and do exactly what Brady Shea is doing. And I don't think it's not a shot at Brady Shea, but you you know, I don't think it's that hard to step into the role he's asked to do and, you know, pick up the slack. So I, I think this, the Rangers are an absolute interesting, interesting case. But I, I, my my hope is and my final realization with it is I really hope the Rangers are committed to a true rebuild and they just stay away just for the sake of staying away. And then depending how the season goes, you evaluate getting our Temi Panera in the offseason. So that's my take on, I guess, the Nylander situation from two different teams side. I mean, the Hurricanes have the most cap space in the entire league right now yeah. at 16 16- Point one four, and then some other numbers. Million dollars in cap space. I mean, those numbers really aren't important for us. They're more important for the teams themselves. I mean, the 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 Hurricanes make the most sense. The Rangers, though. I mean, here's the thing. They have only about one point six five six six 
a uh, million dollars of cap space, but the th- and which is not enough to sign William Nylander, obviously. And, but the thing is, is that I've I've been texting with a few Rangers fans here and there, and the only solution that we could possibly think of would be to trade Matt Zuccarello, who has been out for a while now, four point five million dollars uh, due this year, and then he's a UFA after this season, and. You have to include Brady Shea, who is making 5.25 until 2024. Now, that would hypothetically clear up space uh, to then sign Nylander to, I don't know, a $7.5 million deal or whatever, or in that ballpark. I don't know if that's the best move for them. Uh, here's the thing. I uh, David, uh, David Quinn today said... Uh, when he put in Brady Shea tonight against the Islanders. By the way, Rangers won five nothing. Shout out for Alex Georgiev. Congratulations to Alex Georgiev. Um, you, lo- you love to see it. We we do love to see it. We do. Here's the thing. Uh, Quinn said today that this is the first time all year that a player uh, is sitting that shouldn't be sitting. So Brady Shea came in after being healthy scratch for a couple of games. Uh, and Brandon Smith came out, is now healthy scratch, uh, was a healthy scratch for tonight's game. This is an interesting quote, because now they have seven defensemen who can play in the NHL and only six spots, right? Because Freddie Clayson has showed that he is more than capable to uh, of playing uh, up in the NHL. I mean, what a find by Gorton there. That's true. What a find. No, it was great. He's also making seven hundred thousand dollars, which yeah. is less than Cody McLeod, who's making seven hundred fifty thousand dollars. By the way, Cody McLeod with a goal and a fight. All he needed was an assist for that Gordie Howe hat trick. Future New York Ranger captain Cody McLeod put some respect <laughs> on my guy's name. Future future <laughs> Hall of Famer Cody McLeod. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you. A, I'll go one I, set forward here. Good point. Don't sell my guy short. You're right. <laughs> but I mean, again, they have seven NHL defensemen. Only six yep. spots, which is good if one of them happens to go down and then you have a replacement. However, these are seven capable NHL defensemen. Eventually, one of them is going to be the odd man out yep. with six spots. I mean, if you're gonna if you're gonna move somebody, right? If you're gonna move a defenseman, and if you're gonna move Matt Zuccarello, who has been rumored to be on the move for years now, years. I remember back when it was for Keith Yandel, yeah, that Matt Zuccarello was supposed yeah. to be going to to Phoenix back then. It was for the Phoenix Coyotes. I mean, that was that was a big deal back then. I mean, he's he's been in the rumor mill for years now, but. If you're going to move him, if you're going to move a defenseman, that this trade kind of makes sense for both yeah. teams here. Matt Zuccarello making only 4.5 this season, and he's going to be UFA. The, the, uh, the Maple Leafs desperately, desperately need a defenseman. And Brady Shea is 24 years old, making a team-friendly 5.25 until 2024. I mean... I don't know if this. I don't know if Toronto would take that deal. I don't know if Gordon would take that deal. But on paper, it's it's a fair deal for both teams. If I do say so myself, what do you think about that? Yeah, it's. I mean, in the, obviously the point to like you said, there's a there's, to even consider there's a log jam now. It's just going to get scarier every year. I mean, the the prospects they loaded up on right. these last two off season between Rykoff, Hayek, Lindquist, um, you know, Keandre Miller, like they're gonna have kids coming over very soon, and you know, there's gonna be even more of a log jam. So if you're gonna mo- make this move again, if you think that William Nylander is a guy who think you can help you win, whether it be this year, next year, the year after, then you have to go get that guy because he's such a special player for his age and what he's been able to do. And, you know, obviously he's playing with a loaded team and a loaded roster over there. But, you know, there's no discounting what he's done. So I I, I have no problem making that trade. And I, I got but it's just a matter of like that. That's a big big you know statement by the front office to say that we're making this move now and you know this this rebuild's kind of like we're, we got to speed up because you know this team's competitive david quinn has the boys flying and you know we think we could play with any team on any given night so you know you, you love to see that confidence but you have to you know take a step back and just be like is this what's best for us and and this is why i said on our show too man i just don't envy any nhl gm or coach because it's such a tough decision like i mean because what a pickle jeff gordon has to be in right now it's like you know you you came to this year 
re, you're expecting to be rebuilding. I mean, you release that letter to the fans, and all of a sudden you're tied for first in the Metro at the end of you know pushing towards the end of November. It's it's insane. Like anybody who says they saw this coming is an absolute liar, and that's why again I love the NHL, and it's just so different from year to year. But yeah, I I don't know what it would get done for Nylander. I think Brady Shea is 100 has to be in the picture. And I, the, the, another player that I also think has to be in the picture, you know, I, I'm assuming they would have to be one of like Kreider, Zuccarello and just the way Kreider's played this year. You know, I, I almost think like you, you can't move him. I think that's just a guy like he's, he's playing his best hockey right now under David Quinn. He's got 12 goals now and you know, he's on pace for like a career year. So I, I mean, you don't want to see a guy like that get pushed out in the same deal as Brady Shea, because then it just feels like we're giving up a little too much. But again, like. Nylander's young 60 point per season. Like it's a tough job and I don't envy him, but I, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what it would take at this point because and again, Toronto's hands are kind of tied and they really don't have the asking power anymore. So, well, again, William Nylander isn't 28. He's not 29. This kid is 22 years old. Yeah. I, it's it, you're not trading Brady Shea and Zuccarello or, you know, insert forward here for a rental player. This is a kid that one is only a year older, older than I am, which is kind of, I mean, I don't know how I feel about that. He's, he's he's scoring 60 points and and holding out for millions of dollars. Meanwhile, I'm talking about him uh, and sitting on a chair while I'm at it. And it's, (laughs) and you know, but anyway, William Nylander, 22 years old, 60 point, season back to back 60 point season this this is not a rental player if you trade for Nylander you're gonna get a long term return for him so it is a truly unique position because of Nylander's age he is an RFA but again if you trade for him like you said you are expected to sign him to a long term deal so if the Rangers wanted to uh, they do have around 1.6 some odd million dollars in cap space right now. You trade Zuccarello, you trade Shea. That's more than enough money to sign Nylander to 7 million or, or in that range or what or whatever it is that they agree on. Would that be a smart deal? There's You can argue both sides to it. You can argue that Nylander is coming off back-to-back 61-point seasons. This kid is 22 years old. He's only going to get better. You know, if you trade Shea, Shea, obviously a big piece of that blue line. But again, as we said, seven people to fill six slots. And Matt Zuccarello, who's been a Rangers, who's been loved by the community and by the team for years now, but he's 31, UFA at the end of the year. If you're going to move him, you're going to have to move him now. It makes sense for the Rangers, and it makes sense for Toronto because, again, Zuccarello is a UFA at the end of this year. They have, uh, they need that cap mobility to then get to then let Zuccarello walk. If if so, you know, if they if they choose that path, and they get Brady Shea in a position where they desperately need a a decent defenseman to fill. So it it, it does. You know, it, it's very interesting to see which team would end up getting William Nylander. That trade does make a whole lot of sense for both teams. But really quick, you're kind of bouncing off uh, 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 while we still have a couple of seconds here. The Buffalo Sabres have now won seven in a row. They just beat the Philadelphia Flyers. Seven wins in a row for the Buffalo Sabres. Something that you n- could never have said in the past almost decade now. I mean, this is a team that, I mean, they're, they're, they're about to win. They're, they're in the third period right now. The Sabres are up four to two over the Philadelphia Flyers. I mean, still time left. I mean, the, the Flyers could come back and win this game. Like they almost did against the lightning a a few days ago, but it's looking like the Sabres are going to win their seventh game in a row here. I mean, this is a team that last year, you could not have said that this was going to be a seven game in a row kind of winning team. I mean, earlier this season, you couldn't have said that. And now they are going to, they're about to, I mean, probably going to win their seventh game in a row. They will, they will be tied for first in the Atlantic with 30 points. That's first. That's going to be tied for first in the conference, the Buffalo Sabres, those Buffalo Sabres, that's going to be second in the entire NHL, only Nashville has more points at 31. 
the Sabres are going to be one point behind the league-leading team in points. Really quickly, what have you seen from the Buffalo Sabres that says, this is not a fluke, this team is for real? Well, yeah, obviously you talk about just even you said that like this is a team that couldn't do seven or last year. If you want something that like to make it kind of funny is like exactly one year ago today, they were playing. They, they This team always plays the Thanksgiving, like the Thanksgiving Eve game. A year ago today, they were playing this game ready to lose their seventh in a row tonight. They're going for their seven straight win. So talk about a difference a year makes. It's just huge. And uh, I'm from Buffalo. So like, if I don't watch the Rangers, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty intent on watching the Sabres and I give Sabres fans the most crap in the world. Cause they've just been so bad over the last few years. But you know, when this team's good, I'm just, I'm just happy for them and the fans like this city deserves it. And I went to the game where they played against Vancouver and they're down three, one, they scored two goals in the final like two and a half minutes that like to, to just ridiculous goals look like they should have been playing this way all game. And then they end up winning it in a shootout. And man, I never heard that building as loud as it's been in years. Like I go to quite a bit of games and that building was rocking. The fans could feel it and they just had that different atmosphere. And even tonight, like I know they're playing against Philly at home and it's Thanksgiving Eve, which is the biggest part of the night in the year. And I, you know, just following so many Buffalo Sabres, like, you know, beats and fans that I do, you know, they all said that this, this whole, like the whole area and people walking into the building type for the game. It just felt like a rebirth. And, you know, I, I think a lot of the things they did in the off season helped a lot. I mean, they, they added a lot of good depth pieces. And the sick part is if you want to talk about something that's gross, Andrew is like this team is potentially finish as one of the best teams in the NHL. If they, they keep playing the way they're doing, and they're still going to have three first overall picks next year. So this is a team that can buy yeah. heavy at the deadline, like heavy. And, you know, I, I think obviously getting help from Carter Hutton and that has been unbelievable. Like going from Robert Leonard to Carter Hutton, has been a huge upgrade. I know Hutton got off the cold start here, but right off the bat, I mean, he's been picking games apart now and you know, he's, he's been able to steal some games for them and that's what you need. You know, and sometimes the team's not going to be perfect, but you can look your goaltending and then you obviously add Rasmus Dahlin on the blue line and you know, he hasn't been great. You know, he looked awful in the Pittsburgh game the other day. It just, bad. He was on the ice for every single goal against. He got walked by Derek Broussard, which is not a good game for him. But, you know, you add him to the blue line. That's a kid who's just going to grow and grow and grow and be one of the best defensemen in the league over time. You know, Eichel's healthy. He's playing his best hockey. You add a guy like Jeff Skinner, who has been unbelievable for Eichel, his confidence. Connor Shear is a speedy winger. Like, they added the pieces they need to. And some of the guys who have been here are still playing well. I mean, they have a, a kid up here that Tage Thompson, they got in the St. Louis trade with the Ryan O'Reilly trade. Uh, they have, like, Evan Rodriguez, Jake McCabe. I mean, this, this team has got some like talented young players and, you know, they may not be all stars, but that's how you build a hockey team through depth. And this team's pretty deep and, you know, their centers might be a little bit weaker down the line. You know, I'm still not sold on Casey Middlestat this year yet. And that's a team who I think would love to have a Kevin Hayes. And I, I I really do think that he should be one of the first teams to get called or to be calling for Kevin Hayes because it couldn't seem like a more perfect situation for Kevin Hayes to come in for the next two, three years, however long they want to sign him after this year. Have him be your number two center until Casey Middlestat takes that role from him. And then you have Kevin Hayes as your third center. Sounds like a pretty good deal to me. Like uh, for me, if I'm Buffalo, that should be a team that should be hounding to get their hands on Kevin Hayes, whatever it takes. And you know, I'm not saying maybe throw out one of the first round picks to get him. But if this team keeps playing the way they're doing, man, this the, this city needs a playoff game. And I am I hope they get one because this this area has a new life to it when they do. And you know, I think again, I think the fans deserved it. They've had to sit through some shit hockey with some shit coaches and a shit GM at the time. So to get kind of get rewarded with what they're doing now. You love to see it. And again, that's just one of those teams. It's like, it's almost like, you know, when the Cleveland Browns win a game, it's just like, you know, it, they've been so bad for so long that you, it's almost endearing, but this Sabres team, I think could be for real. And, you know, I think teams, I think I really hope teams and fans start taking them seriously because, you know, it's proven that they can win on any given night and winning seven straight in this league is not easy. And to do so as a team that lost seven straight exactly a year ago today, you know, I, I just love to see it. And these are the kind of stories that are easy to root for. It's similar to like the Vegas last year, just so easy to root for a team like that and you know when a team that goes through stuff that like they did and just the Sabres being as bad as they were it's, it's easy to like it's easy to like and I, I don't see why anybody should be crapping on it unless you're a Toronto fan I guess but yeah <laughs> the Sabres have three first round picks as you said they have their own pick they have the Sharks first round pick and they have St. Louis's first round pick St. <laughs> Louis by the way second to dead last in the NHL yeah. uh, William I mean the, the Buffalo Sabres only have about half a million dollars in cap space but they have three first-round picks, as we said. 
Let's say they move a Zach Bogosian, 5.1. Uh, Zach Bogosian is a very strange contract. He makes $5 million. Zach Bogosian makes $5 million? $5 million, oh. $142,857. That's a strange, very random number. I don't know. I don't know how they concluded to that specific number, but I mean, regardless. For two more years, I, this this year and then next year, Let's say they move that contract. Let's say they move another contract like a Kyle Ocposo or, I mean, or a Sobotka who's, who's making 3.5 mil for this season and the next season. Let's say they move both of those contracts. Then now they have space to sign William Nylander. I'm, all I'm saying, uh, it's all, I'm, you know, uh, Sabres are definitely a, I mean, in my mind, they're a dark horse to get William Nylander only because look at how good they are. And if they get Nylander now, that offense is going to be very scary to play against. Yeah, I. If this is this is a team. If like they do make the playoffs, this would not be a team I'd like. I'd circle on my calendar, and be like, I want to play them because that they're, they're just such a weird, scrappy team, man. And if you look at the way they've won some of these games, like they they come from behind all the time. I mean, the other day they played. Pittsburgh and in the other just the other day they played Pittsburgh they were they were down four to one the yeah. team rallies and scores four to tie it or three to tie it in the third and then win in overtime and like I said the Vancouver game they were down two goals with three minutes left they scored the two goals and went in a shootout like they're doing insane things to win games they, they are the definition of the term relentless this year like there's two teams who I think have been relentless this year and it's the Rangers and the Sabres because neither of these teams just quit through 60 minutes like they you know the Sabres might have might have good first second periods but damn man they play hard in the third and like you know that, that if that wins them hockey games you know, it may not be easy to watch if you're a Sabres fans, but you're going to love the end result because that team's going to come out flying in the third. Like you said, they're on pace right now to beat the Flyers. There's two minutes left. They're up four two. You know that, and this team, man, and, and I love it. I, I, I'm very happy for Jack Eichel. I think it's very rewarding because I think there could have been a legitimate conversation of you know, should this kid walk after his contract, his ELC? Like, should this kid try to try to get elsewhere because you know they're just not getting him any help? And you know they make, like I said, they made big moves this year with Skinner, Sheary. Like, I mean, even players like Vladimir Sabah. Baca, Berglund, like some of these guys that like just good depth players to learn from. And, you know, like I said, it, it just makes a big difference and good for Phil Housley too, because I think he was starting to get his job under fire a little bit. And I don't think it was rightfully so because of the roster he had in front of him. So it's good to see him get some wins under his belt and have a legitimate chance to, you know, be a good coach in the NHL and with the Sabres. So, I, you know, I love to see it. They just buried another goal here. Empty net five two. this game's done. So there's seven in a row for the Sabres. Seven in a row for the Buffalo Sabres. Brian, this was an awesome conversation. I, as always, really appreciate you coming on. Tell the people, tell me, tell yourself, tell everyone that's listening out there, where should people follow you and where should people listen to you uh, on your podcast? Yeah, uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Brian Otanic. If you don't like Rangers and gifts, I suggest just moving on because that's all it's pretty much going to be is just bad food takes apparently and Rangers and gifts. But yeah, if you want to listen, I host the Garden Faithful podcast. It's a strictly New York Rangers podcast. Uh, episodes come out every Thursday, not this Thursday because of Thanksgiving. But you know, you can find us on iTunes, Google Play, SoundCloud, Audio Boom, and uh, you can also catch me on the New York Giants weekly podcast on Gotham Sports Network, reading advertisements for uh, dick pills. So that's just where my uh, <laughs> My, my uh, podcasting career is at right now. So, you know, it's going good. That means you've made it, man. That yeah, means I mean, you've made it. And, and ironically, it is the high point of my career. Uh-huh. So, yeah, <laughs> love to hear it. <laughs> Brian, you're the best as always. And I really appreciate it. And I'll talk to you again real soon. Yeah, anytime, man. Let me know. Absolutely. And that was another episode of Chell Squared. I'm your host, Andrew Chelney. And I'll talk to you again next week.